Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Global Connections. And we're going to talk today about what can we expect from the ICJ, the Internet of Co International Court of Justice. And for this discussion, we're going to talk to Rupmati Khandakar, Dr. Rupmati Khandakar, who's going to help us understand what is going on in The Hague. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay, and it's so nice to be here with you, as always. So we're talking about the International Court of Justice now. Let's go, Jay. Yeah, what is that? What is it, and how did it, how did it get in the room? Um, what's the connection with the United Nations? Uh, what's, what's the authority of it, the composition of it, the procedures? Can you give us a, a, you know, some kind of a structure here? So Jay, ICJ is the International Court of Justice located in, at The Hague in Netherlands, and it's one of the six principal organ, organs of the United Nations. So it's a world court, like you, it uh, decides between disputes between country and country, so, or country and international criminals. This is the kind of jurisdiction that this court holds. So it's like um, um, a court where countries go as members. And it's coming to the picture because we are, we are seeing South Africa file a case against Israel, wrongly filing a case against Israel. So let's discuss this one, Jay. It's going to get interesting. Now, why South Africa should file this? I mean, there, there are so many Arab countries that, um, you know, have complained in the media um, and voted against Israel in the General Assembly. Um, yes. All of a sudden, surfaces South Africa. Why South Africa? Now, uh, as you said, Jay, in the General Assembly, uh, the uh, decision gets up to the Security Council, gets vetoed by allies, and then it comes down to nothing. We've always discussed that uh, play in the United Nations. Now, South Africa started filing this case against Israel and uh, first accusing it of apartheid, and genocide. So this is a new, new for uh, all of us to see, because uh, out of all the countries, South Africa taking a moral stand and talking of uh, Israel uh, carrying out genocide and asking the court to take cognizance of this uh, matter. But Jay, it doesn't work that way because the basic context they fail to mention. Why did Israel act in this? They don't. They forget to say that it is. Uh, in response to a terrorist attack. Well, before you so, go there, yeah, is this really South Africa, or is somebody putting South Africa up to it? You know, we have seen, for example, Iran um, yes. attacking Israel um, kinetically with weapons of all kinds of nature, unlimited weapons, as well as propaganda uh, mm -hmm. through proxies, always mm -hmm. through proxies. So it has to be a possibility anyway that South Africa is a proxy for somebody. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Absolutely right, Jay. Absolutely right. Because South Africa having the uh, moral standing to take such a uh, ground against Israel needs the backup of several uh, money-loaded uh, Islamic countries to put there. And they want to show a neutral country, a non-Islamic country, filing this case against Israel. So that makes it a plus point for South Africa to take the center stage. And, I'm, I'm uh, wondering if there's a quid pro quo here. I'm wondering yeah. if it's more than just doing a favor for somebody like Iran or some one of those Arab countries or a combination of countries that don't like Israel and don't like Jews. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's uh, something else uh, in the quid pro quo, like money. And I, yeah. I recall reading recently that Nauru backed out of his diplomatic connection with Taiwan uh, yes. after that election of Lai ching Te a few days ago. Um, and China was real ticked off about that. And, and presto, what happens is Nauru backs out. But then the back news is that China paid Nauru to back out. They paid him something like $100 million to back out. Nauru is a small country. That's a lot of money for Nauru. So I'm wondering if uh, there was some kind of quid pro quo here, too, that there's uh, unlimited funds out there somewhere and somebody's paying off South Africa. What do you think? That's so right, Jay. And uh, South Africa being paid the amounts that you talk about, 
uh, is very easy for them to take this, uh, you know, this uh, incentive because it just portrays them into onto the international stage, but they're benefiting a lot from this money financially. They're in a rut. You know, you a few days, few months back, we were seeing stores being looted in South Africa. There was havoc on the streets of South Africa. They did not have a good economic system. Recession had hit them hard. So any money which was coming from anywhere was always a welcome uh, thought for them, Jay. Yeah, so, you know, uh, South Africa would be about the last country you'd select. Maybe nobody else was willing to do it. All of a sudden, South Africa. You know, I mean, I hope the world is wondering why South Africa, uh, which has such baggage in its history about race and about the conflict, it's extraordinary that it should be South Africa. And I really wonder why, after all this time, there has been so little focus in the very same court the uh, ICJ, over the obvious uh, war crimes and atrocities and genocide, to use that term, because it's very clear, in Ukraine. Why does the court not care about Ukraine for two years, but all of a sudden it cares about Israel, uh, which is, you know, something that got started only in October? Um, I mean, that's when, that's when the massacre took place. So I'm I'm wondering, you know, why we have such an irregular span of attention. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, Jay. Uh, you know, first when they spoke about this, uh, the country had to actually show a dispute between country to country that South Africa had gone to Israel and spoken about this dispute. They uh, had discussed and could not reach an agreement, and so they had gone to the International Court of Justice. This was this is a mandatory procedure that has to be followed before any issue comes up before the Court of Justice. South Africa did not do that. South Africa has gone directly to the International Court of Justice, and that foundation for this case is one of the main points for Israel to say that first South Africa has to come and discuss the matters of genocide with them, then show that they can't do anything about uh, the 1948 genocide convention uh, implementation or violations that are happening. And then you bring the International Court of Justice to supervise in this case. South Africa has superseded that point and gone directly to the ICJ. So that's where we catch them, Jay. And that is a big point because uh, directly going to them is uh, a problem. And Jay, I'll tell you one thing, this case is very, very uh, crucial and uh, you can, very blatant in its approach because they, South Africa denies Israel the right to self-defense. And that becomes a big, big, big issue, Jay. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the charge is that Israel is engaging in genocide. I think it's, it's simply that. Um, yes. and, and they come and they have some remarks made by some some people associated with the Israeli government, but who do not speak for the Israeli government, who do not control or articulate policy for the Israeli government. And, and they're relying on comments that, uh, that some officials made, maybe lower officials made, um, with regard to how angry they were at Hamas and the Palestinians. Right. Um, and I think the case is based largely on that. So they spent yes. two days, two days in a hearing, and I Correct. guess they heard both sides. They heard the, um, um, they heard they heard South Africa's position. They heard the Israelis' rebuttal of that, and I think they heard a third time from South Africa. And they closed yes. it. That's it. That's, That's it. No visit. Maybe they couldn't aff afford the airfare to Israel. You know, maybe they didn't want to get involved in a conflict zone. Who knows? But, um, you know, th that's the whole thing. That's what they got. And I find it extraordinary that after all the evidence that has been gathered in Ukraine and elsewhere, you know, think yes. of Ai Weiwei's movie, uh, Human Flow. There's such unhappiness, conflict, um, and genocide in the world. This, this is where the ICJ would focus. This is where um, South Africa is concerned. Really strange. Anyway, okay, yeah. so... What were the substantive positions taken? Yeah, CJ, they spoke about the genocidal intent. They they are arguing, South Africa is arguing that 
Israeli army intended to finish off the race. Now, the intent is a response. It is not intended for to go against a race or anything. The words that Netanyahu used were not uh, the biblical context. He said Israel has the most moral kind of troops and they will do their best to protect the existence of their state. He did not say go and destroy another state. He said protect your state, do your existence. Now, existential crisis, they have swept under the floor and they're talking of the intent of Israel to wipe out the Palestine when we hear chants of free Palestine from the river to the sea. They want to wipe out Israel in every slogan, Jay. I mean, it can't get clearer than that. And to talk about the genocidal um, uh, actions, we all have discussed this, that the operations of Hamas were from hospitals, were from schools, from residential houses. Civilians were used as shields. Where is the fault of the in Israel Defense Force in dealing with this? They are dealing with terrorists. They are dealing with ter human shields who are willing to help and protect the terrorists. And everything mounts up to an existential crisis for Israel. And apartheid uh, genocide, I don't think it falls into the uh, violations of the 1948 Convention of uh, Genocide at all. And apartheid, Israel has always published every sign in three languages. Israel has always accepted diversity in its professions, in its uh, daily life. You know, there has been no segregation of a race or there have been no attempts in daily life to wipe out a race like it was the case done in Africa. I think South Africa was banned for apartheid, if they don't remember it very well, they have a problem of apartheid. And to accuse another state of apartheid is a far-fetched possibility, Jay. So Israeli lawyers can turn back and talk about their own glass houses before they speak about somebody else. You know, I think that their arguments are, are on YouTube. You can find them, um, you know, in yes. great detail. Um, you can find them verbatim. But what, uh, one thing I don't know if the Israeli uh, side of it mentioned is that um, that it, over the past decade or so, maybe two decades, um, the, the Palestinians have not been um, the, the victims of yes. genocide. In fact, their population in both the West Bank and in Gaza has doubled. So if, sure. Israel, if Israel wanted to make genocide and wipe them out as, as a race or a culture, uh, they, they've done a really bad job because the Palestinians <laughs> are twice the number they used to be. Uh, and and as, as I think they did make the point that, hey, if Israel wanted to uh, kill a lot of Palestinians, they could have done that on day one. But they didn't do that. And they took yes. all these very humanitarian steps to avoid, um, you know, uh, killing uh, Palestinians. So, I mean, I find it it's really ironic that South Africa should do this and it should omit all these things. I mean, it's obvious that the hostages are still hostages. Uh, in yeah. fact, what, what happened just today, Mahdi, is that there are two hostages um, and, and uh, Hamas said that if the Israelis did not back off immediately, they would kill the hostages. I find, I find that extraordinary. They take hostages, they upset everybody in the, in the Jewish side of the equation, the Israeli side. Some people are not upset about that, I, uh, and that's regrettable. Um, and, and then they threaten to kill them essentially one by one by one making by one. demands. You know that is so gross. Um, the, you know the whole the whole thing is is gross, and I I don't know how the United Nations and the ICJ can ignore that. They must read the paper just like us. Uh, they they must read the you know the horrible atrocities. I mean, cutting women's breasts off with box cutters that's out there. We know yes. that, and and I I hope they know that. That's war crime. That's war um, crime. There's so many war crimes. Here are these peaceful people living in peaceful communities, doing yes. agriculture and the like, and um, yes. all of a sudden they're attacked in a murderous fashion. Uh, in the most brutal, horrendous way, uh, and yet it's the Israelis that get charged with, with war crimes.
um, it's just hard to believe. It's you know in psychology it's called projection, right? You huh. you project what what the other guy's doing to you on the other guy, and all of a sudden you're you're at fault when he is really or she is really at fault. Uh, Donald Trump <laughs> does that, you know. <laughs> Anyway, no, okay, so what, what, what can happen here? You know, the, uh, the former chief judge of the Israeli court is on the ICJ. Why? Because somebody appointed by um, Israel, that is the defendant in the case, has to be on that court. So they had to include him. Barak is his name. And uh, he's sitting on that court. I don't know how persuasive he will be with the others. There, there are quite a few of them. Um, but at least we know that he's there and he can see the deliberations. But what are their options? What can they do? There was an article I sent it to you by guy named Horowitz. It was, and uh, it was in within Times of the Times of Israel, Israel Times, um, where he said, "What can they do? I mean, what what is a legitimate solution here for them?" And his answer to that was, "Dismiss the case, man. Dismiss the case." But is is there a middle ground? Uh, how 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 confident are you that they will dismiss the case? They should, Jay. They have to because the very crux of the uh, case, the very basis, the foundation of the uh, uh, case is the intent of Israel. And they have conveniently forgotten to mention or manipulated it to mention that October 7 was a terrorist attack of which Israel responded. They have not said that. Just The discussion is just about the case is just about how Israel has a genocidal intent, how they have genocidal actions uh, of wiping out a race, and how they are denying humanitarian aid, and to which all these claims, there is a, a rational uh, counter-offensive point that the intent was a response to the terrorist attack. The uh, uh, intent was never genocide because there was a warning of 20 days given to evacuate the civilians. There was the Israeli army has always acted in uh, after Reiki, after uh, proper manipulation, everything. Then they act. They have not done random firing or random bombing. There has been no carpet bombing of Gaza. It has been, you know, like we said, they were going over the rubble. The tanks were going over the rubble. They also have to be careful about the minefield that is set in. So, the, where is the genocidal intent? If they wanted, they could have done it like Putin and sent drones all over and destroyed Gaza in a matter of two days. Yeah. But in, this, in these things, in these operations, even Israeli hostages were killed, the three Israeli hostages which were killed by mistake when they came waving white flags by mistake. So it's a very uh, thought out a war plan in response to a terrorist attack. But the court is arguing that Israel is uh, going uh, violating the 1948 genocidal agreement uh, so that is absolutely wrong. And it will get dismissed because I think Israel has a strong defense. And even whatever happens in the court of justice, Israel's right to exist cannot be denied. Well, one of the things discussed was whether Israel should or would abide by um, a decision requiring it to, uh, to do a ceasefire, a unilateral ceasefire. And um, my view, and a lot of people I know, their view is that uh, Israel should should not abide by that decision. It's a, it's an outrage, and as you say, it's existential for Israel. Yeah. Is, Israel knows we all know that Hamas will do it again and again if permitted to do so. And uh, if they do a unilateral ceasefire, um, Hamas will do it again right now, and it will be tragic beyond description and outrageous. So the other the other possibilities that he mentioned was well they could uh, demand that uh, Israel provide more um, humanitarian aid. Well, Israel is providing a lot of humanitarian aid already, and they're permitting it to enter from Rafa and whatever else. And and the only problem is that the um, that there seems to be a a, a, a block at the Rafa gate, and uh, yes. Israel is trying to expedite that, but but cannot. Um, it can it only can allow so much in, I think. I'm not sure. But it, it, it has taken the position that it's not an Israeli matter because it's other people are responsible. How about the United Nations? 
uh, are responsible to provide that aid and make sure it gets into the right hands. I mean, we have all kinds of indications that it's not getting into the right hands. It, it's, uh, it's feeding and supplying Hamas and not the, the Palestinian people there. Um, and that Hamas is raiding the storehouses. We've seen yes. photographs of that. Um, so, you know, I don't know if that's a solution that this court should consider. It's meaningless. It goes nowhere. Um, yes. it, is, it is something up to the UN itself. Um, let's see. I, there were other possibilities, too, but none of them were meaningful. So what I think what this turns out to be is either you, you tell uh, Israel to make a unilateral um, you know, ceasefire, fire, stop, um, or you don't. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. So they're not satisfied just in asking Israel to stop, Jay. They want Israel to be declared a criminal. And that is where the problem is lying, and that is where the uh, defense is getting more vocal about it. Because how can you, dis you know, uh, this uh, what is that? Designate a defending country to be a criminal? It is uh, facing such antagonistic enemies. Yemeni Houthi people, they felt the need to uh, uh, attack Israel. They start. They're, they're too far away. They're tribals. They went and they attacked the ships in the Red Sea. So, uh, so this kind of, uh, you know, inner, we've always talked about how they are, you know, uh, what is that? They are, in their minds, they have this hatred for Israel and they don't want Israel to exist. How can Israel not defend itself? And when, if, if the International Court of Justice under the UN had passed this kind of a judgment that Israel is wrong, they couldn't do anything about it. So this kind of... Uh, hanging uh, situation that is going on. And uh, Jay, we have seen how hesitant uh, UN has been to declare uh, Israel as a defend as a victim. They've always portrayed uh, Israel as an aggressor and the support that it gets from its allies as uh, being false. And they boo it in the corridors of the UN. But those allies are, are the ones who have also faced similar terror attacks. So Everybody is in the same boat because of the same casualties and calamities that they have faced due to these terrorists. It's not a coincidence that you are an ally. It's a coincidence that we have faced the same fate. So that's why they know what is coming next. Well, you're right. I mean, the context is that there, Israel has a number of enemies for whatever reason, proxy or otherwise. Um, and um, uh, this is a very well-organized asymmetric war against Israel. You know, yes. I remember reading that uh, October 7th, um, they had the massacre. October 8th, the propaganda was all already in play uh, to criticize Israel for what happened. Because I find that extraordinary. And people bought that. And so the ones, the ones who are setting this up, uh, Iran and, and some of these Arab countries, are, are, are setting up a multi-front war. Look what's happened in Lebanon. Uh, look what's happened uh, in the East Bank, West Bank, I'm sorry. Look what's happened uh, in Yemen and the, and the, and the Red Sea. So it's a forefront, a forefront multi-front war. Um, yes. And it's, it's, it's of great concern. Um, I remember, for example, and we've discussed this, that, um, that whoever knew about this shorted the market the week before the massacre and made right. millions upon millions of dollars because at the massacre, all the companies they shorted, which were largely Israeli companies, you know, lost stock price. So that's another front, an economic front on this war. This war is intended to destroy Israel. This war is intended to hit Israel on every single asymmetric angle you could think of. And this, in The Hague, is one of them. This is yes. another, another front for Israel to have to cope with. And it is an outrage that nobody sees this. But let me ask you this. There must be pressure on these judges. I mean, I, I do not feel, and maybe this is due to the fact that the American justice system has suffered so bad, so badly in the last couple, few years. Um, there must be political pressure on these fellows who sit on the court. They, they have prestige. They have credentials, I'm sure. Um, but query... There must be people 
who would like to see them rule against Israel. Do you feel that's so? Do you, and who, uh, who is putting that pressure on them? Yes. Jay, the populist vote uh, tries to go against uh, Israel. And like you said, that is uh, the added pressure on the judges to pass a uh, judgment against Israel and in favor of South Africa. But uh, the arguments that they have been presenting that Israel is going against the 1948 convention is absolutely baseless. And that is why they cannot give a more, you know, if the case, I, I, like you said, let me point out to that, that there was money given. And this case was maybe filed in a haste. And that's why there is no proper, you know, uh, bringing about the formation structure of this case. So it fails at the basic level. They were in a hurry to put this case into the court of justice. And that's why it's not properly framed, Jay. And that is where it loses out its uh, validity. And the judges can be caught on technical grounds now this time, rather than going into the arguments, technical ground that South Africa did not go to Israel and discuss this before they brought it into the court of justice. That disagreement that has to be shown, that you had a conflict country to country, and when you all couldn't solve it, then the International Court of Justice has, has come to arbitrate in your dispute. You cannot just directly go to the court of justice and say, I feel this one is doing something. You should have gone to Israel first, discussed and um, disagreed, and then brought it to the court of justice. So they did not do this. So technically, they are at a fault. And the judges can never go on fault for technical error. Mm, that is a very that. big point for Israel. Well, you know, the, the thing that, that I keep coming back to in my mind, and we, we don't know enough yet, I would like to examine a, a list of the judges. I would like to see where their um, propensities lie. Um, I would like to examine whether they may be affected. Because I feel, just as I feel this in the United States Supreme Court, uh, which mm -hmm. used to be worthy of our uh, ad admiration, but no more, um, yes. I, I feel that, that this may turn out to be something which is baseless political. Mm -hmm. Political, yes. just the way the Security Council is political, and just yes. the way some of those votes in the General Assembly are absolutely political. The United Nations has been politicized and very likely weaponized in this yes. multi-front war against Israel. I think the media must see that, must examine that, every single judge, where the pressure is coming from, and whether this is just another example of the politicization of the, the UN. What do you think? The UN infrastructure, Jay, only a sole intergovernmental organization of the world, but does nothing or null to uh, uh, solve the problems of the world. They don't come in where there are conflicts. They don't come to protect the civilians. They don't come to protect the uh, you know countries where there are. They don't act against the terrorists. They don't have a definition of terrorism. They don't uh, hold. Uh, individuals or countries accountable. I mean, it's a farce that they have this uh, institution and then having an international court of justice, uh, which is, you know, functioning as per uh, populist, new, uh, you know, pseudo-liberal uh, waves in the international world. So this kind of, uh, you know, non-implementing authority that we have in the United Nations falls short at every stage. Whatever they say, how can they implement it? They don't have any structure for implementation. Well, I'm so, glad of that. I, I don't want to see them tell <laughs> Israel to, to back off. And uh, Israel then has a dilemma. I think Israel could and should defy an order like that. But let, exactly me, let me go to it, another thing, though. You know, th again, this is a coordinated effort. And yes. maybe there's a, somebody in Iran, maybe somewhere in, in the other parts of the Middle East that coordinates this stuff. So we have protests already um, where people are out in the street uh, supporting Hamas and supporting the Palestinians and calling for this court to find Israel guilty. I mean, it, it was very quick, just as it was quick right after the massacre. It was quick, right. these protests. Okay, and uh, for its part, Israel had a protest, a different kind of protest, where they had a lot of people gather in what is now known as Hostage Square in Tel Aviv. Oh. 
um, yes. calling for the release of the hostages. And of course, that got nowhere, nowhere. And this court, um, you know, this court cannot resolve that problem, can it? Uh, it no. won't. <clears throat> but no. here's my here's my question to you. This, there's a differential here. The court could mm -hmm. rule for Israel or against mm -hmm. Israel. Okay? If it rules one way or the other, what happens? What happens in the Palestinian and Arab world? What happens in the United States and the college campuses? Uh, what do they do? Do they do protests? And what happens if Israel wins? What happens if Israel loses? What are we going to see? Uh, if Israel wins this case, if Israel loses this case, the right for Israel to exist will be protected very fervently, Jay. Because that is, you know, that is, I. how can I tell you? It is, uh, uh, it is such a human right. It's Israel's human right. It's Israel's country's right to exist. A country in the southern part of the African continent cannot dictate terms to a country which is being bombarded. And, you know, civilians are being attacked every day. So there is a lot of difference between what is written on the table and what is happening on the ground. And uh, that uh, will never, ever affect Israel. Even when the Secretary General uh, did not mention Hamas, Israel was unfurtered. They, they were very strong and they're determined. And that determination comes, Jay, because of lack of fear. They have lost the fear after losing so many lives. There is a, uh, you know, there is a perception, like you always say, of it happening again in the future. And that cannot be compromised. So Israel will keep on getting stronger. Let, you know, another few countries join them if they want. But Israel versus South Africa and the International Court of Justice does not stand a chance yet. Israel will win this war or, you know, it will be dismissed or it will be neutralized because of technical points like we discussed. But Israel will never get, um, you know, the determination will never go down because of a judgment of the International Court of Justice. It is very clear. You have to see the mindset of uh, the average Israelis, especially those young, sweet kids uh, who are in the service. They are, yeah. they're, uh, they come from the Holocaust, where six yes. million Jews yes. were concerned. And uh, that that sort of forms their their moral fundamental. Anyway, let me go. Let me go to one um, other thing, um, yes. and that is, um, you know, uh, I think you've answered it in part. Um, how how does it affect um, the war? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Israel has uh, has slowed down its bombing uh, unilaterally. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, Israel is making progress in finding more tunnels. Um, um, but as a matter of fact, they can't find all the hostages. And yes. some of the hostages we know were sold. Yes. Were sold. They were sold to Hamas. They were sold by Hamas, uh, exchanging them with various uh, members of, of the, um, you know, of, of, of the, the civilian community. Uh, so, how does it affect um, the way people think about this? Do you, do you feel that, for example, the people in Israel will change their minds about how things are going, depending on the result here? Um, do you think that the people in the U.S. will change their minds? Jay, we are fighting, fighting mindsets also. We have discussed this in the dimensions, that uh, the, the mindset of the Israelis are to come into a square and protest against the government to save the hostages. The gatherings in the squares of Gaza were to see the hostages being taken and, you know, women mistreated. That was the kind of gathering in the squares of Gaza, even when there was going to be a future bombardment. So the mindset is very important. And, you know, protests in uh, America, when they don't know what will happen, if, who are they protecting? They're protecting terrorists, you know. Uh, the, the rallies were in favor of uh, uh, the oppressed and depressed Terrorists, poor thing, poor victims that they were. But, uh, you know, Israel uh, was having this, they have to fight domestic pressure and they have to fight the terrorists. Now, hostages, they could not uh, bring it to a complete uh, situation. The situation is still ongoing. And like you just mentioned, they bought about two hostages just to stop the uh, level of the war. After Israel finished northern Gaza tunnels, uh, 
they slowed down because they know that they have done the majority of work which was there. Now they have to go. It's a long drawn process. It cannot happen in a matter of days or months or weeks. And stalling it with these, uh, um, you know, judgments and you know, they are part of that attempt to present Israel in a bad light Jay, in the media when you have a court case against Israel. Uh, yeah. They highlight well, the point. It's a propaganda war like we've always discussed. But let me, let me uh, ask you my last question now. Um, so uh, Donald Trump won in Iowa. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sad to see that because I, I would not have wanted that under any circumstances. Um, yeah, and when he, when he won, he got up and said uh, that if he's elected president, he will finish the war in Israel immediately. He didn't say how he was going to do that. Uh, he didn't say what, you know, what fantastic things he would do, either mm -hmm. to destroy the Palestinians and Hamas um, mm -hmm. or to destroy Israel. It's not clear uh, what mm -hmm. he has in his mind. He didn't say. Um, but he started taking possession of the issue by making that statement. Okay. Um, now, Joe Biden, he's on the other side of it, and he's done a lot uh, to try to um, soften this conflict somehow. And he's consistently taken, at least, uh, you know, by the rhetoric, he's taken the Israeli side of it. So yeah. query, how do they come out uh, of a decision by the ICJ? Uh, luckily for Israel, Jay, U.S. will always remain an ally. Because uh, strate geostrategically, Israel presents the most, it's a vantage point in the Middle East. And uh, it's a very close friend and it's got historical roots. You know, you have ties which go beyond presidential terms of four, four years. And that is what helps uh, uh, Israel-US friendship bond. Okay. And uh, Trump coming in and <laughs> saying that he's going to solve the Israel and Ukraine issue is now going to be a, a you know a theater to watch you're going to have lots of shows to discuss that day and he's not going to stop and, and he keeps on talking as if it's just a matter of a, a, a few decisions but it's gotten complicated and israel has got a 15 billion dollar uh, allotment for war right now so you can understand what is the you know extent that we are looking forward yeah, well, anybody's guess, and and certainly we, we can't trust anything that Trump says. No. He, he can forget his comments the day after. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I I um I'm very interested to see how this plays out. You and I should cover it again in a few I days' think. time. We'll know more, uh, and we ought to examine um, you know the inner workings and hidden mechanisms of this court in retrospect. Yeah. And we'll be back for more Rupmati Kandakar. Dr. Rupmati Kandakar, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for having me. Aloha, Jay. Aloha.